Hey there everyone, and welcome back to another very special upload. It's time that we catch up with Seth and Mackenzie, and possibly get a look at something ominously sinister. So sit back, grab a snack or a drink, and get ready for a night of action, chills, and just straight up fun. Welcome back to Confronting Evil. Eddie Harper was your typical nerdy IT guy. He was pale from not getting much sun, he was balding and had thick coke bottle glasses. He didn't really have any social life and often worked late into the night, fixing the computers of people who went out and lived it up. It was on one such night that he was walking to the bus stop to go home when he started hearing strange sounds coming from the alley to his right. Not wanting to find out what the weird scratching and growling sound was, he tucked his hands tightly into his pockets and continued walking hastily toward the bus stop. He was startled once again when he reached the bus stop by the sound of thudding and thumping coming from inside a car across the road. He shrugged it off as what he assumed to be teenagers in the act of passion. Not wanting to disturb them, he tried to ignore the sound, but when he heard a muffled scream from inside the car, he couldn't help but look up to the source of the noise, and in doing so, he witnessed a splattering of blood spray across both the front and back side windows of the car. The man jumped and yelled before running down the road, moving away from the threat as fast as possible. He began hearing chuckling from all around him. Several voices from unseen sources taunted him. He ran as fast as he could, but soon felt the cold grip of deathly hands upon his shoulders, and as he ran, his feet began to lift off the ground. A few days later, a dark metallic teal Ford Torino rolled through the western Pennsylvania suburb before stopping at a local restaurant for a bite to eat. Hey, uh, can I, uh... The girl paused before ordering. Can I get a triple bacon jalapeno blue cheeseburger, some spicy fries, and a slice of chocolate pie, please. The petite blonde ordered at the counter. Sure thing. Will that be all? The cashier asked. Nope. My brother would like something that's never had a pulse because he doesn't have a pulse and refuses to live a little. She replied before her darker-haired brother stepped up to the counter with a sigh. Um, sorry about that. Do you have, like, maybe a vegan burger or something like that? The man asked. We have a garden fresh salad. The cashier said, obviously not getting a lot of people with vegan sensibilities through the place. Thanks, that'll be great. The man replied with a smile before paying for the meals. How do you eat all that crap, Mackenzie? The young man asked as he handed her a cup to get a drink from the soda fountain. <laughs> Pretty easily, actually. I just open my mouth and bite down. You should try it sometime, Seth. Live a little. Mackenzie said as she filled her drink. Hey, Mackenzie, did you see this? Seth said as he reached down beside the soda fountain to a newspaper stand filled with issues of the local newspaper. Several dead, drained of blood, authorities baffled. The main headline read. It was quite the eye-catcher of a title, and Seth was sure that there was a case here. Something very strange was going on in this little suburb. The two of them got their food and sat down to eat where Seth continued reading the paper as Mackenzie began stuffing her face with spicy, bacony goodness. It says that a local IT guy claims to have been attacked by a gang of people with fangs, Seth read. Vampires. Mackenzie perked up, pointing her finger at Seth. I don't think it could be that simple. Seth said, before reading aloud some more. He claims that a gang of leather and denim wearing... Seth paused. A gang of leather and denim wearing what? 
Seth? Mackenzie asked. A gang of leather and denim wearing vampires, like from an 80s movie, attacked him and lifted him off the ground after witnessing a murder across from the bus stop near his building. Seth finished reading the story. See? Bloodsuckers. Mackenzie said, pointing once again at the paper. <laughs> Sounds like some guys that would hang out at a seedy bar, top of an old Mexican temple. She joked before taking a bite out of her burger. We should pay Mr. Harbour a visit, Seth said, folding up the newspaper before digging into his salad with vigor. Mackenzie just shook her head at her brother before taking another huge bite out of her greasy cheeseburger. After their meal was done, the sibling duo made their way to the marketing firm where Mr. Harbour worked. Who do you want to be? Asked Mackenzie. Jack and Jill again? She continued. Wait, I got it. She finished, holding up two fake IDs from the full suitcase that they had. Agent Sutherland and Agent Patrick, FBI. Seth rolled his eyes and grabbed the Patrick ID. The two of them stopped at a gas station and threw on their cheap, two-piece suits that they had picked up at a second-hand store before moving on to the marketing firm, further into the city of Pittsburgh. Hello, I'm Agent Sutherland and this is Agent Patrick, FBI. Mackenzie said as the two of them flashed their fake ID badges to the woman at the counter. We'd like to speak to Mr. Eddie Harbour, please. Is he at work today? Seth asked the young woman. Um, y yes. I'll let the guys over at IT know that you're coming. Just take the elevator up to the second floor, and you can find the IT department at the end of the building. You should find Eddie there. He wasn't looking too good when he came in this morning. He hasn't really looked too good in the past few days, actually. Is he alright? Is he in trouble? She began to fear for her co-worker. He's fine. Not in trouble. We just have to ask him a couple questions. Mackenzie said. Okay, we'll head on up. I'll let them know. The lobby clerk replied as she reached for the phone and dialed IT to let them know that the FBI would be arriving shortly. The two siblings went up the elevator and down the hall to the IT department at the other end of the building where they found an African-American guy with curly hair and glasses sitting by a Caucasian man with fairly shaggy hair. There was also a red-headed woman and a man with long hair, and all of them were stuffed into a fairly small office for the bunch of them. You must be here for Eddie. The shaggy-haired guy said before pointing to the bald man sitting quietly at the shaded window. Thank you. Would you all mind waiting outside for just a few minutes, please? Seth requested of them before the two of them moved over to the man, leaving his co-workers to walk out into the hallway and close the door behind them. Excuse me, Mr. Harbour. Could we have a moment of your time, please? We would like to ask you a few questions. Seth spoke. The man turned around, and they saw that he looked like death. He was skin and bone, and his eyes had begun to sink back into his head, revealing the shape of his skull beneath the skin. Oh, man. Mackenzie couldn't help but audibly allow her thought to come out upon seeing the man's condition. Mr. Harbour, are you all right? Seth asked. I'm tired. So tired. The man mumbled. Would you like some coffee? You look like you could use some coffee. Um, maybe a cheeseburger? Mackenzie offered him, getting a weird look from her brother. No! Eddie Harbour blurted out. I, I mean, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, but I, I can't eat anything down and just the thought of eating turns my stomach. He explained, causing Mackenzie to turn and look at her brother. Have you been having any light sensitivity? Or have you heard anything out of the ordinary, like what might sound like whispering or ringing in your ears? Seth asked the man, concerned of what he was hearing. Yes, yes, what is that? What, what is happening to me? Eddie asked. I don't want to freak you out, but I think you already know. Mackenzie answered him. What do you mean? What did they do to me? Eddie inquired, a bit scared. You said the thought of food made you sick. 
Are there any foods that don't make you sick? Or have you had any strange cravings at all? Seth asked. I, well, I, I don't know if it means anything, but when I said I could eat a horse, I was being li quite literal. I want to eat a horse. I'm so hungry. The IT guy answered weakly. You know what you saw. You know what happened. Mackenzie told him. I was... Eddie paused. I was attacked by a gang. It... It was a gang crime, probably some kind of new initiation. He reasoned with himself. You described them to the police. They weren't just a gang and you know it. Mackenzie lured him in to revealing the truth for himself. They... they bit me. They were vampires. I'm a... I'm a vampire. Eddie realized, his voice breaking a bit as he began to freak out with realization. No, not yet. You haven't killed anyone yet. You aren't a full vampire. We just have to kill the one that turned you, and that should reverse the process. Seth attempted to calm him. He's right. Mackenzie began. You're a ghoul. She added, getting a facepalm from Seth when he heard the words come out of her mouth. A ghoul? What? What's that? Eddie began to ask in a panic. It's the stage between human and vampire, before you make your first kill and drink blood. Ghoul is usually a slave to their vampire master. Mindless automations that just do their master's bidding. So you kind of lucked out to be not drained to that point. Mackenzie explained. Not helping him. Seth grumbled to his sister. I don't feel so lucky. Eddie said sadly to himself. Alright. Sorry, Eddie. Now I need you to answer something really important. Now think about this for me. I need you to think about the guy that bit you, and I need you to tell me exactly what you see in your head when you do. Mackenzie apologized before going immediately into action. Uh, I don't know. I see, uh, I see railroad tracks and, um, the subway, I think? Eddie concentrated. That's good. What else? Seth said. Um... The number 34, I think. No, wait! The sign's dirty and old, and part of the number is worn off. It's 84. Eddie informed them. Alright. Cool. Now you sit here and finish up work, and we'll go take care of your problem. Mackenzie told him. But I thought it was gonna help you. Maybe be your guide. Tell you where they are or something. Eddie said, kind of disappointedly. I'm sorry, Eddie, but we can't have you going there with us. You can see some of your master's thoughts but you see that works both ways. You can also see yours. It's kind of a double-edged sword. So if you came with us, you might be more tipped off to our arrival. Seth explained the situation, where Eddie lamented and agreed to stay behind. The two of them quickly left and hurried to the station off of 84th, leaving Eddie behind to finish his work day. Hey guys, he said a short while after the siblings left. I'm gonna head home. I'm not feeling so hot. He added, before gathering his things, clocking out, and heading out the door. He couldn't go with them, but they didn't say anything at all about being an observer, and he was sure that he could still be useful somehow, even if only as a distraction. The sibling duo arrived at the station and flashed their fake badges in order to gain access to the underground tunnels that were not open to the general public. There, they found an old sign with a portion of the eight rubbed off to make it appear as if it were a three. This is it, Seth said as he shined his flashlight over to the wall to find a caved-in part that led into what appeared to be a disused maintenance walkway that connected to an old subway worker break room. Wait! Wait! Mackenzie whispered. Before we go in there, remind me not to touch any Chinese food. She requested of Seth, who just once again rolled his eyes at her. Did you call me the dweeb? Seth joked. Ass. She joked back before continuing on into the old hallway. Mackenzie peeked around the corner to find the place lined with 
old posters from bands that spanned the 60s through the 90s, along with neon lights that flickered along the walls. The bar signs and more risque advertisements in green and purple lights. Further inside, she saw what they had come for. A group of six men lay curled up against the wall, laying in the fetal position, knees curled tightly to their chests. They looked exactly as Eddie had described in the paper. They wore denim jackets and leather coats, blue jeans and tight black pants, chains and studs all about. They had that punk rock look that became popular in the 80s and their taste in music from the posters that lined the walls further enforced that idea. They even had some instruments lined up along the wall to the side of them to complete the look. Punk rock vampires? Mackenzie whispered as she readied one of the wooden stakes that they had brought along. You take Ben over there, Mackenzie said pointing to a sleeping vampire with brown hair and a ponytail. I'll take care of Tom. She finished as she moved toward her blonde-haired target. The two of them positioned themselves near the two vampires and raised their stakes to prepare to move their legs and strike. Then, without warning, they were startled by the sound of a man's yelp and the thud upon the ground, where they turned to see Eddie Harbour climbing to his feet near the entryway to the room. Sorry, guys. Eddie managed to say before the group of bloodsuckers jumped to life. A guy with long, curly, blonde hair sprang forward, clawed hands reaching from the sleeves of a studded denim jacket. The brow line and cheek structure of his human face was contorted to resemble features that fairly closely resembled that of a bat, his skin curving and wrinkling in odd ways. Two long, fanged teeth pierced out of his gums in front of his row of human teeth, and with these he attempted to take a chunk out of Mackenzie's arm, but she was able to dodge his bite and counter his attack with one of her own. She punched the bat-like beast square in his upturned nose, causing it to turn bloody for a moment before the crimson fluid sucked back inwards into the beast's nostril and the thing healed itself, shaking off the attack. Seth was immediately thrown across the room and into the drum set, which caused quite a racket, waking the remainder of the beasts. The first of them went down with a guy with a long brown hair and a ponytail and a suit full of leather pants and jacket, jumped through the air, lunging at Mackenzie's neck. Instead, he found the sharp end of a stick, which pierced into his chest, where he instantly gripped the protrusion before screaming loudly as the fires of hell burned him away from the inside, the remainder of his soul being drawn to its cursed end. Seth jumped to his feet, using the distraction of their fallen bandmate to his advantage. He flung a symbol across the room and into the head of another vampire in denim, stunning him enough to allow Mackenzie to drive a stake through his heart as well, where he too was burned away from the inside by hellfire. A guy with short, blonde hair sprang forward. Seth ducked between the beast and his sister to protect her, and in doing so, he grabbed the iron dagger from behind her back and drove it through the skull of the short-haired bloodsucker before his sister finished the job with another stake through the vampire's heart. Three down, three left. Mackenzie dodged an attack and grabbed a hold of a bass drum that had been knocked her way. She used this to wrap up the larger of the vampires by slamming it down onto him, where his head ripped through the drum and his arms were pulled into his body by the steel rim of the drum. This gave her enough of an opening to send him into the fires of hell as well. The smallest of the vampires was about to be disposed of when they were interrupted by a voice. Stop! He yelled, and the few of them looked up to find a guy in a black leather trench coat, his face wrinkled and contorted into that odd, unnatural, bat-like face hung over the neck of the terrified IT guy. The siblings immediately stopped what they were doing, allowing the smaller vampire to flee to his boss's side. You're going to let us leave, and you're not going to come looking for us the lead vampire said, and a kind of strangely 
soothing voice. Please don't hurt me. Eddie begged. Shut up, Baldy. Yelled the younger, punk vampire from his side. You know we can't just let you go, Drac. Mackenzie mockingly informed the bloodsuckers. Then, I guess you leave me no choice. The vampire with curly, platinum locks bit deeply into the poor man's neck, ripping the chunk completely out of it, causing his blood to spray like a geyser all over the wall of the room. The vampires quickly fled with supernatural speed, using the severely wounded man to delay the advance of the hunters. Eddie immediately gripped his neck, blood spilling from between his fingers. Mackenzie quickly removed her jacket to act as a bandage for the wound, pushing it hard into his neck. The vampires had disappeared, but luckily they were able to get Eddie to the hospital in time to save his life, and doubly as lucky as it appeared as though they got the vampire that did the deed, and Eddie would make a full human recovery. He was very grateful to his saviors and newfound friends, and offered to pay them, but Seth refused his money. It was the fact that he was alive that was payment enough, while Mackenzie scoffed at the idea and suggested that he buy them a pizza for dinner and cherry pie for dessert. He agreed, and they left town with their reward, heading further to the west, leaving the city a little bit better than how they had found it. Mr. Harbor was safe in the hospital, as well as for him and his life, was saved and forever changed. The man sat there and sighed, and when the nurse left the room, he removed the bandage from his woundless neck and tossed it into the bin before looking into the small bathroom mirror. I'll have to try something else, Eddie said, as he loosened his tie and looked into the mirror. His left eye flickered with a ruby red color, almost as if a gem itself was set into the socket. Then, one long, black claw extended its way from beneath his fingernail, where he used it to slice through the skin of his face, shedding that form and leaving the hollow shell of Eddie Harbor laying in a bloody mess of a folded suit of skin upon the hospital room floor, where the thing with one red eye assumed a new form and walked out of the hospital without question. Sometimes the truth of the matter lies just beneath the epidermis because one's benign facade may only be skin deep. I sure hope you enjoyed this episode and I can assure you the monster slaying duo will return very soon. Keep an eye out for the next Confronting Evil premiering November 27th.